You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. The world has changed since the first iPhone was released in 2007. Along with its competitors, the smartphone has transformed the way many of us live. We're always on, always reachable, forever checking and refreshing. Have you noticed how commuters spend their journey head down, engrossed in the digital world and oblivious to everyone around them? Do you know people who can't start eating until they take a picture of the dish and post it on Instagram? How many children are playing with their phones instead of their friends? When was friendship degraded to clicking like? Just a decade ago, none of that was happening. Cal Newport, the author of Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World, has a remedy. It's an entire philosophy beyond simple tricks or tips. It's an entirely new way of thinking that will enable your liberation from over-reliance on the digital world. This philosophy is called digital minimalism, and it's the subject of this book insight. Newport is not a hermit living somewhere in the Himalayas, growing his own food and meditating all day long. He's a professor of computer science at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., a best-selling author, and a popular blogger. He's written five books, including Deep Work from 2016, which explains why the ability to concentrate on a demanding task is becoming increasingly rare and valuable in today's distracted world. After the publication of Deep Work, Newport started receiving countless emails and was approached by people after his presentations, all asking the same question, what about our personal lives? They agreed that the ability to focus at work was crucial, but they wanted to know how they could deal with the exhausting, endless distraction of social media that had come to characterize their social lives. This is what prompted Newport to research and write about digital minimalism. In this book insight, we'll explore four key themes. First, how digital life got out of control. Second, what digital minimalism is. Third, how to declutter your digital life in 30 days. And fourth, the life you could be having if you begin to practice solitude, have great conversations, and reclaim your leisure time. Let's start by looking at how and why smartphones and social media have taken over the world. Have you ever thought about the drain social media has on your time? How checking a message quickly turns into scrolling down newsfeed pages, leaving Facebook or Instagram likes, and disappearing down Reddit rabbit holes? Newport offers two explanations for this behavior, intermittent positive reinforcement and the drive for social approval. Together, they make social media so addictive. Intermittent positive reinforcement is a fancy psychological term describing random rewards for repeated behavior. By studying pigeons pecking buttons, psychologists discovered that unpredictable rewards release more dopamine, a neurotransmitter which causes cravings, than predictable rewards. The same mechanism makes gambling addictive. Interestingly, likes and other feedback buttons work in the same way. Your smartphone is like a slot machine. By crafting the best comment or sharing the most interesting videos or pictures, you're like a gambler who's betting on what seems to be the lucky number or card. After you post something, you're tempted to check and check again how many likes you've won. The apparent randomness of this process, because you never know how much you'll win, is what makes this bet so exciting. And, of course, you can increase your chances of getting positive feedback by giving likes to your friends and hoping that they will reciprocate. This leads us to the second mechanism that makes social media addictive, the drive for social approval. We are inherently social creatures, a gregarious species whose survival over millennia has depended on cooperation and mutual help. In order to cooperate and receive support, humans first had to be accepted by their families and tribes. As a result, the desire for social approval is deeply ingrained in our psyche. In fact, as Newport argues using studies from neuroscience, thinking about other people and our relationships with them is so fundamental for us that it seems to be the default mode of our brains. 
On the face of it, social media has given us a fantastic tool to engage with our friends. You reward your friend's comment with a heart icon. She thinks you love what she wrote, and both of you feel your position in the social group is reinforced. And, of course, the sooner you respond, the happier she'll be. You're now expected to reply as soon as you receive anything, regardless of what you're doing or how important or inane the message is. This unpredictability, coupled with the desire for social approval, makes you interrupt what you're doing and reach for your phone just one more time, until the next beep and vibration distracts you again. If this sounds like an addiction, that's because it is. The comedian Bill Maher calls checking your likes the new smoking. But this isn't as intense as substance addiction. It's a moderate behavioral one. The problem is that it causes an almost constant moderate anxiety. It's especially detrimental to teenagers and young adults who've been surrounded by digital technologies for most of their lives. Not surprisingly, they're the ones who suffer the most from mental health issues related to internet addictions and anxiety. This situation hasn't come about by accident. The large companies which operate in what Newport calls the attention economy, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and Google, have invested billions of dollars to make social media and internet use addictive. For them, you're a product, not just a consumer. They sell the time you spend using their services to advertisers. Your attention is their currency. Here's Newport talking with The Breakfast Club about how people get hooked to digital addiction. So this guy's the editor of a, a, a large publication, and he was telling me, he's like, this idea, he's like, I have this idea in my brain that I'm going to miss news, right? And this is his job, Correct. right? I'm going to miss news. And he's like, here's, here's been my experience. I would be better off probably if I just waited till the next morning to see like how it shook out and what's the, what's the story that got written, right? Like get the paper. Facebook didn't start out as an attention monopolizing service. The original site, thefacebook.com, merely provided a directory of college students and represented one digital diversion among many. And when Apple released the iPhone in 2007, the main thing Steve Jobs focused on at the launch was integration of your music with your phone, meaning you didn't have to carry around your iPod, too. The iPhone was also great at making calls, with a touchscreen dial pad and easily scrollable contacts. Internet access on the go was not a big selling point. There was no app store in 2007, and Jobs didn't even like the idea of his beautiful iPhone being covered in apps like Facebook or Twitter that Apple had no control over. How things would change. It's now hard to imagine life without your phone and without access to its apps. But how can you protect your attention from being sapped by Google, Facebook, and the others while still maintaining the key benefits they offer as well as your sanity? Sure, there are some tricks and productivity hacks which can slightly reduce the time you spend online. You could also go on a brief digital detox to regain focus and recharge your batteries. Newport doesn't recommend such short-term tactics. Instead, he advocates a complete rethink of your digital life. You have to completely reinvent your relationship with your smartphone and social media. Let's take a quick break, but when we come back, We'll continue our look into Newport's digital minimalism. We'll define what digital minimalism is. Then we'll look at how you can declutter your digital life in 30 days. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our look into Cal Newport's digital minimalism, choosing a focused life in a busy world. It's the follow-up to Newport's immensely successful productivity book, Deep Work. We'll ask the question, what is digital minimalism? Then we'll look into how you can achieve digital minimalism in 30 days. Newport defines digital minimalism as a philosophy of technology use that involves focusing on a small number of very important things while gladly giving up everything else. It's based on three principles, the cost of clutter, optimization, and intentionality. Digital minimalists understand that the real value of most electronic devices, apps, and websites isn't enough to justify the large investment of time and energy the average person makes in them. 
you should analyze the costs and benefits of a given technology before you make it part of your life. Newport talks about American philosopher and essayist Henry David Thoreau, who spent two years in a small cabin in the woods near Walden Pond in Massachusetts. Thoreau's 1849 book Walden describes the experience of, as he put it, living deliberately. He carefully calculated all his expenses living at Walden Pond and realized that by hiring out his labor for one day a week, he could cover all his basic needs and live at a very low cost, while spending the bulk of his time reading, writing, and enjoying nature. He contrasted this with how most people lived. They had to work hard, maintain assets, and be constantly stressed only to afford some luxuries to make it all seem worthwhile. The profits from their hard work were a few things they could show off to their neighbors that cluttered up their homes. In short, they were living what Thoreau called lives of quiet desperation. Newport compares these 19th century workers to modern people who spend 10 hours per week on Twitter just to obtain a few likes, the odd laugh, and nuggets of news. Clearly, they haven't done a good cost-benefit analysis. If they had, they would realize how they're squandering their precious time. This is the cost of mental clutter. The second principle of digital minimalism is optimization. It isn't enough for a particular technology to provide some vague benefits. Newport, who has no social media account himself, says how people often berate him for this choice, arguing that he might be missing out on something. For him, that's the worst sales pitch ever. Digital minimalists aren't afraid of missing out. He says what worries them more is diminishing the large things they already know for sure make a life good. When they do go online, they only engage with the particular features of particular apps or websites that unambiguously help them in their work and life. They optimize their use of them instead of letting them be the random default for any bored moment. Newport bases this principle on the law of diminishing returns, which states that after reaching a certain point, the resources you put into something will bring you less and less output. If you watch or read the news every hour, you'll get lots of breaking news headlines, but you won't necessarily learn any new insight. Instead, if you optimize the process, you could carefully select which news sites you follow, even which writers, as well as when and where you read or listen to them, say only on a weekend morning in a favorite cafe. This way, you'll cut through all the clutter, repetitions, and fake news, and you'll be more likely to learn all the important stuff in one sitting. Better still would be to read a book that goes deep into the issues behind the news. The final principle of digital minimalism is intentionality. Newport suggests aspiring digital minimalists could learn about the principle from an unusual source, the Amish. Contrary to popular belief, the Amish are neither stuck in the 19th century nor are they completely isolated from the modern world. It's not uncommon for them to use expensive, cutting-edge technologies, such as solar panels or computer-controlled precision milling machines. But they believe in simplicity and intentionality. Someone tries a new device and then considers what benefits it could bring to the community without disrupting the simplicity of life that the Amish cherish. Only if the benefit is unquestionable will they make an investment. They've thought it through. Newport encourages you to rethink your relationship with your devices in a similar way. Do you use them just because some startup from Silicon Valley offers them? Or do you use them intentionally, as tools which make your life simpler and more satisfying? The cost of clutter, optimization, and intentionality are the three underlying principles of digital minimalism. But to put them into practice, Newport encourages you to implement what he calls a digital declutter. In December 2017, Newport sent an email to his mailing list. He asked his readers to attempt a digital declutter during the month of January and give him feedback about the experience. He expected 40 to 50 volunteers. Over 1,600 signed up. Newport was able to use their experiences to refine the process of digital declutter. It's very simple, consisting of just three steps, but by no means easy. He insists on a full month, arguing that taking just a few days off from digital noise isn't enough to make lasting changes. Step one of the digital declutter is define your technology rules. Schedule a 30-day period, preferably a calendar month, in which you'll take a break from optional technologies. 
Newport defines these as apps, websites, and related digital tools that are delivered through a computer screen or a mobile phone and are meant to either entertain, inform, or connect you. So don't worry, your electric toothbrush and toaster are safe. But Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, video games, and TV would be considered optional technologies for most people. Checking your work email, for example, or regularly calling your family overseas by Skype, fall outside this category. It's important that you don't confuse convenient with critical, though. There are many devices and programs which can make your life a little bit more convenient, but they aren't essential. Still, if you really have to use some apps, say WhatsApp or Instagram, for work purposes, then establish clear operating procedures. That is, specify in advance to yourself exactly how and when you will use them. Step two is to actually begin the 30-day break. This is harder than it sounds. You may find yourself reaching for your smartphone while standing in a line, commuting, even while talking with friends or driving. You'll be surprised how much it's become an automatic habit. Newport tells us about a young management consultant who took the challenge and left only a weather app on her phone. In the first week, she knew the hourly weather conditions in three to four different cities. The impulse to reach for the phone and find some distraction was so strong that even the temperature in a nearby town became interesting. But this uneasiness and habitual phone checking passed after a couple of weeks. Here's where the second part of this step in the decluttering process kicks in. To make the changes effective and sustainable, you must fill the void left by the optional technologies you eliminated with meaningful and satisfying activities which will improve the quality of your life. A large part of Newport's book is devoted to explaining and promoting such practices. We'll move on to that section shortly. For now, suffice to say that many novice digital minimalists exchanged news feeds for books, social media commenting for journal writing, and instead of texting family and friends, started actually visiting them. In place of mindlessly swiping pictures, they resumed long-abandoned hobbies, such as painting or playing an instrument. Once you have defined your technology rules, obeyed them for 30 days, and replaced the optional apps and devices with more meaningful activities, it's time for the final step on your way to declutter your digital life. Perhaps surprisingly, step three of the digital declutter is reintroduce technology. You've lived without optional technologies for a month. You've proved that it's possible, but you still may decide to reintroduce some of them to serve you. That's what they're supposed to do anyway serve you, not control you. Remember that if you go back to your old habits and treat the decluttering experiment as just a short detox, you'll miss the whole point of digital minimalism. Instead, think about the optional technologies that you've avoided one by one and ask three questions about each. First, does this technology directly support something that I deeply value? For example, perhaps my spending time on Twitter doesn't support a specific value, but Skyping my cousins overseas helps strengthen connections with my family, so I'll keep it. Second, is this technology the best way to support this value? Regular Skype conversations may well be the best way, whereas clicking like on my cousin's pictures probably isn't. Third, ask yourself, how am I going to use this technology to maximize its value and minimize its harms? This echoes what the Amish do when they consider introducing technologies to their communities. They'll only go ahead if there's a clear net benefit. Here's Newport recapping this process on CBS. All those apps that you uh, randomly downloaded, all those services you signed up for on a web, take it all out of the proverbial closet. Step back, get back in touch with how you actually want to spend your time, and then very carefully begin reintroducing only the things that are going to give you that big benefit. When you follow the three steps of the digital declutter process, you'll regain control over your digital life and liberate a lot of precious time. But as we've seen in the second step, you'll have to fill this free time with rewarding activities. Amidst the digital fog, many of us have lost track of the things we really enjoy doing. In the next section, we'll discuss some of Newport's main suggestions for cultivating leisure time. We'll take one final break before wrapping our book insight on digital minimalism. When we return, We'll conclude by examining the benefits of a digital minimalist life. Then we'll end by looking at any criticisms and defenses of Newport's philosophy. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? 
If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our look into digital minimalism, choosing a focused life in a busy world. It's written by computer science professor, blogger, and author Cal Newport. Here's Newport talking with CBS. One of the easiest things you could do is you know, take off your phone, uh, any app where someone makes money every time you tap on it. Not having it with you, being free from the sort of digital slot machine that exists in your pocket, that change alone is going to have dramatic benefits to your life. We'll explore the benefits of a digital minimalist life. Then we'll end by asking if digital minimalism is too extreme of a lifestyle choice. The first practice that Newport promotes is solitude. He defines it as a state in which your mind is free from input from other minds. For the first time in the history of human species, the ability to spend time just with oneself and one's thoughts is disappearing. Since the invention of the iPod, more and more people have suffered from solitude deprivation and consequently, anxiety. We now think it's natural to have a constant background noise of music, beeps heralding incoming messages, lights flashing from multiple screens, and other incessant distractions. It shouldn't be this way. Newport claims that humans aren't wired to be constantly wired. Solitude ought to be an integral part of our experience. Abraham Lincoln, Rene Descartes, Isaac Newton, Virginia Woolf, Steve Jobs, and many others regularly resorted to solitude and often attributed their most creative ideas to time spent alone. To make your own solitude practice most effective, Newport suggests long walks, in the wilderness if possible. While walking, you can connect with nature and completely detach yourself from the bustle of city life. There's now a ton of research pointing to the mental benefits of time in nature. To help build this habit, Schedule your walks in a calendar and treat them as appointments with yourself. And crucially, leave your smartphone at home or in your car if you must. Another good solitary pursuit is writing and journaling. Writing structures and clarifies your thoughts, records your memories, and helps you organize your life. Newport has a stack of notebooks which he has filled at a rate of one per year since 2004. Looking back, he found that one particular book contained the kernels of the ideas behind his best-selling books, Deep Work, and So Good They Can't Ignore You, and indeed the notion of digital minimalism. The next set of practices that Newport recommends is about conversation. Our brains are sophisticated social computers. When we're talking with a friend, billions of neurons are constantly firing. In a split second, we're subconsciously analyzing her words and body language, as well as changes in the surrounding environment. Every twitch on her face or a slight inflection of her voice signals something, be it hesitation, annoyance, joy, agreement, or some other emotion. For millennia, our species has been developing this capability to catch on to what someone else is thinking and thus successfully navigate the social world. Not surprisingly, it takes years of regular social interactions to master these skills. Reducing this rich, layered interaction to a one-bit like or emoticon is, Newport says, the ultimate insult to our social processing machinery. To say it's like driving a Ferrari under the speed limit is an understatement. The better simile is towing a Ferrari behind a mule. To solve this problem, Newport recommends conversation-centric communication. The basic idea is to engage in a slow, complex, and nuanced conversation with another person, preferably face-to-face, but video conferencing or even telephoning are also acceptable. Set aside time to contact friends, or have what Newport calls your conversation office hours, times when they know you're available to take calls. Otherwise, keep your phone on do not disturb mode so that you're not always on call. Naturally, you can allow calls from certain numbers. As for text messages, deal with them in one go at a given time to avoid texting to and fro and waiting on responses. In other words, use your phone as a tool for enabling communication but don't be a slave to it. This discipline may result in some weaker digital-only ties falling by the wayside, but the richer, genuine relationships you'll be nurturing offline will be ample compensation. Let's now move to practices you can use to reclaim your leisure. An important part of the digital declutter 
is filling the void left by the renounced or restricted optional technologies. It's a good idea to consider this part of the process before your 30-day digital break, so you're well equipped to deal with the free time that opens up before you. And if you don't give up social media altogether, it's worth scheduling in specific time slots for it, in what Newport calls low-quality leisure time. That way, you don't let it impinge on its counterpart, high-quality leisure time. In the middle of a busy day at work, the thought of doing nothing in the evening or on the weekend may appeal, but it's actually far more beneficial to do something. It's better to learn a new skill, such as playing an instrument or even operating a chainsaw, than to watch TV or scroll through your phone. Leaving your comfort zone, working at the frontier of your abilities and expanding them to solve challenging and meaningful problems, make your activity intrinsically motivating, pleasant, and rewarding. Somewhat ironically, you may find yourself turning to YouTube how-to videos for your newfound hobby, be it crochet, woodwork, or in Newport's own example, mending a bathroom fan. This isn't an issue. As we've heard, digital minimalists make a point of using appropriate digital resources for well-defined purposes. Probably the most important rule, however, is that whatever you do, you should try to make it social. For instance, you're likely to have more fun playing simple board games like Monopoly, Scrabble, or Settlers of Catan with friends you can see and talk to, rather than killing dragons in World of Warcraft with a guild of avatars. Joining a group exercise session or a park run is far more enjoyable and motivational than an hour of running on a treadmill solo. Digital minimalism offers countless other tips and pieces of useful advice. Much of what Newport suggests may seem like common sense, but it's also an urgent call to action and, no doubt, Facebook and Instagram's worst nightmare. Our habitual use of digital media has gotten out of control. In this book, Insight, we've discussed how and why this has happened. We've analyzed the digital minimalism remedy that Newport offers and its underlying principles. We've also learned about a method to declutter your digital life in 30 days. Finally, we've explored other long-neglected ways to better spend our time, including enjoying periods of solitude, practicing the art of conversation, and reclaiming quality leisure time. These things improve our relationships and provide for a meaningful and satisfying life. Newport admits that the idea of becoming a digital minimalist might sound extreme, yet this reasoning has it backwards. Long hours spent on social media, staring at a phone during dates and family reunions, or texting while driving, it's these that are abnormal extreme behaviors. We just don't recognize them as such because they've become so common. There's a lot of people who advocate digital detox weekends away, or so-called hacks such as turning off notifications and keeping your phone out of the bedroom. These are well-meaning, Newport says, but won't break our digital addiction. The more drastic action he prescribes is challenging. You can't do it lightly, and you'll need to get friends and family on board before going off radar, or letting them know about your new strict limitations. Newport makes it clear that digital minimalists do not reject the innovations of the Internet age. They simply reject the way so many people mindlessly engage with these tools. The only compelling argument to use a given technology is when it's the best option to support an important value, satisfy a certain need, or solve a specific problem. Seen through this lens, most optional technologies prove to be just that, optional. About half of the volunteers who completed Newport's month-long digital declutter experiment deactivated their social media accounts, while the other half simply deleted them from their smartphones. It would be interesting to see the results of a follow-up survey studying the long-term effects of this experiment. Newport's case is all the more persuasive when it exposes the psychological vulnerabilities that the attention economy giants are exploiting. The human craving for social approval, for example, and the billions of dollars they're earning from our time. Joe Hollier and Kai Wei Tang, the inventors of the new dumbed-down smartphone, the light phone, sum this up. Your time equals their money. If becoming a digital minimalist means rebelling against big business, feeling more free and in control, and rediscovering your own leisure time into the bargain, it's a hard-to-resist philosophy. Newport may have started a quiet revolution.
Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.